by a long way of saying we didn't have a bulletin. If you have your Bible with you, turn to Psalms 102. Psalm 102. We're going to read through verses 12 through 22. I won't read them because we'll be looking at them kind of verse by verse. The Psalms chapter 102 verses 12 through 22. And again, we're thinking about God's divine day of deliverance. God's divine day of deliverance. Psalm 102 uh, verses 12 through 22. I wonder if you're at all like me and you wonder where God is when the wicked prosper. Um, where is God when we see this happen or that uprising or that war or that calamity? We wonder, especially the man-made ones, where is God in the midst of all of this when the wicked are quote-unquote prospering? Well, as we'll see tonight, he's where he always is in control. You've heard that phrase, man plans, God laughs. The, uh, the wise man said, man proposes, but God disposes. And the scripture itself says, also in the book of Psalms, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, but God is the judge. That's one of many scriptures that illustrate where the personal presence of God is or where heaven is, if you want to look at it that way. It's north hundreds of millions of miles, no doubt, uh, beyond the north axis of this planet. So God is in control. He can lift up one and put down another whenever he takes a notion. I want us to look first of all at the time and then a little closer at God's divine day of deliverance. These um, verses actually follow a psalmist, and we don't know who he was, some um, citizen of the nation of Israel, and he's going through a hard time. He's lamenting. He's a follower of Yahweh, but he's lamenting because he's facing persecution of some kind from his enemies. And the way he phrases it, he has been taunted and denounced in such a way that even when he eats, his food is mingled with his own tears. So the idea is he's even bursting into tears at mealtime. I don't know whether you've ever, ever had a crying, Jag. I have. Sometimes they come quite unbidden. I had one just a couple of weeks ago, um, just driving down, down the road on the way to church. Uh, fortunately, I made it here all right. But these things happen, especially if you've got something going on uh, under the, uh, what would you say, under, <laughs> underneath the outside, and you're not aware of it. Something can be cooking there, and then uh, nature will find a way of getting it out there. And it's, it's better to have it out where you can deal with it. Like the uh, great, pro the great uh, wise man said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Isn't it true, though, that he, in a sense, is describing the, area, the era in which you and I live? You know, what I would call in the midst of madness. Uh, just when you think things are calming down, they, they, they go sideways again. It seems that people in charge, their word is maybe good for a day at a time, used to be a week at a time, much less now in many areas. And when, when this keeps piling on and piling on and piling on, now I don't know what your view is, but I think something permanently changed with the pandemic. And um, I know most churches have felt it. Uh, it seems like people's attitudes toward themselves, toward one another, toward life was perhaps irrevocably changed through all that that pandemic did. And to, to where, in a sense, they're not the way they used to be. They don't live the way they used to live. They don't look at life the way they used to look at it. It's a completely different situation. And it, <clears throat> in some places, it almost seems like it's going to be permanent. So we look around and our senses tell us, why in the world do the wicked always prosper? Why does it seem like the deck is always stacked in their favor? But here's the thing, and we're going to see this very clearly tonight, and that's why I think it's an encouragement. God's watch is not set to ours. We want everything to return to normal or better than normal yesterday. But as Moses said also in the book of Psalms, chapter 90, a day in God's presence is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. 
St. Peter in the New Testament belonged to the same denomination as Moses. He said exactly the same thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Look into the Bible, you see this lived out. About six or seven hundred years before the day of Pentecost, Joel was inspired by God to prophesy in the last days Yahweh would pour out from His Spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy, men servants, maid servants will prophesy, right? And the day of Pentecost took place when? 2,000 years ago. So according to Joel, who saw it 700 years in advance, the last days have already lasted two millennia. And likewise, we have... Uh, John the Beloved in his letter saying, Little children, it is the last aura, hour, 2,000 years ago. So the last days and the last hour has lasted, have lasted 2,000 years so far. And you look, about, you look at it not only for everyone in general, but what about people? According to the deacon Stephen in the book of Acts, Moses was called by God to deliver Israel when? Yeah, really, from, from, obviously from birth, from eternity, but spelled out in terms of, of our time when he was 40. It came upon his heart, Stephen said, when he was 40 to deliver the children of Israel. The Old Covenant doesn't tell us that. And when he arrives to bring peace between two, two struggling Israelites, they said, who died and left you, boss? In other words, they didn't get the memo, so they rejected him. And think about this, called at the age of 40, he didn't actually get sent till he was 80. Four decades went by before he ever finished his task. How about Joseph? He has the dream at the age of 17. How long did it take to get to the palace? 13 long years. And don't forget, he took a pit stop. First to the pit, then to the prison before he made it to the palace. 13 long years. Years And the Bible says, again, in this same book of Psalms, among other things, he was laid in iron. It also says his soul entered into iron, which means not only his physical body suffered, but his inner man suffered. Sometimes I think I'd prefer physical pain to emotional pain. I've talked to other people that sometimes agree. And so this is, this is really interesting, the, the timing and, of course, Paul, we've mentioned a number of times, on the road to Damascus when he was arrested by Jesus and converted, when he made Jesus Lord, the Lord said, among other things, I'm going to now send you to the nations. Well, just study the life of Paul, the book of Acts. He never preached to pagans, to non-Jewish folk, for about 13 to 15 years. So even Jesus' is now is different to ours. But here's the good news. Even though we may not know when things will turn around, we can know what and how. Really, just think of the pandemic. It did turn around. Just like the old cliche, nothing very, very bad or very, very good lasts for very, very long. It's not what it was two years ago, right? Uh, I went, we went to this festival. They didn't even have it in 2020. They had a Zoom festival. And uh, last year, uh, about a third of the attendance as before the pandemic. This year, about half. So it's still, still better, 150 people, not 300 or 300 plus, but still better yet. So even in the natural, we do see things changing. But in terms of, of a permanent change, this is the good news. It is coming, and I think, among other things, we should be preaching this to each other. We should be talking to each other about it. I think ministers should preach on this more often, especially nowadays when, again, it looks like nothing's ever going to change and the deck is always stacked in the, uh, in, in the favor of the unrighteous. Here we begin. Psalm 102, verse 12. We're just going to go through this. But you, O Yahweh... You will be dwelling unto eternity, and your remembrance unto generations and generations. Do you see what happened here? The psalmist has changed his focus from his immediate circumstances to upstairs. 
He stopped looking down at his food, crying over it, and he's now looking up. Deliverance is never to the right or the left, never in front or behind, never below, but it's always from above. You can be boxed in, but as one preacher said, it's always open up top. I put this in my book, and we have the new version now back in the, in the rack. I had a dream, and in the dream, I was with my friend Jonathan and his mother, and we were in a beautiful white room with no doors. It was literally no way out of that place. And within a few moments, there was a door in front of us to the left and one behind. And the Lord was basically saying, it may not look like there's a way out of whatever is boxing you in, but I know something you don't know. How many are glad about that? God knows more than we do. We see little bits of the painting, one corner, uh, the left side. Someone else sees the top. God sees the whole painting at once. I'm so glad he does that. So the psalmist is continuing here. You, you will be rising and you will be having compassion for Zion because a time to favor her, because a time of meeting, it has come. Isn't that a beautiful picture, God arising? Where does he arise from? You have to read other scripture, his throne. We sang a song just recently. Oh, the glory of his presence, come and rise from your rest and be blessed by our praise as we glory in your embrace. How many remember what happened when Stephen sealed his testimony with his own blood? He said, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of majesty on high. The Lord personally stood up to embrace Stephen as he came. When God rises, it means he's fixing to do something. He's going to change something. And again, it may take a while. How about the nation of Israel? When we think about our nation, America, other nations, the nation of Israel had to wait how long? for deliverance from bondage in Egypt. Four centuries, 400 years. Payday isn't always Friday, but it always comes. Now this is prophetic language, look at this with me. I'm trusting this is gonna be really encouraging to those here, those watching now, listening now, or downloading this later, or watching it later. Prophetic language, the word time here, and I, I consulted the 70, and again, I remind us, one-third of the body of Christ considers the Greek Old Testament, the 70, inspired scripture. The Orthodox Church believes that it is on a par with the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament. Now, we don't necessarily believe that, but it's not a bad thing to study and to look at, especially when our New Testament came to us in that language. The Lord Jesus preached and taught and conversed in that language, and so did the early church. All the letters are written there in Greek, including the letter to the Hebrews. So, the word time in the 70 is keros, not ronos. Ronos is this kind of time. We get the word chronograph from that. Hours, you know, seconds, minutes. It's not that. It's keros, which we would call a season or a set time. And watch this. The word meeting actually means an assembling. This is a beautiful picture. We're talking again, think about this, God's divine day of deliverance. It's talking about a certain set time or season when there will be a meeting or an assembling of people. Notice also what the psalmist says is going to be the place. Zion. Look what the psalmist said. You will be rising and you will be having compassion for Zion. He does not say Jerusalem. He doesn't say Israel. If you study this out, you'll find when the scripture uses the word Zion, it's talking about the spiritual aspect, the spiritual nature, the spiritual Jerusalem, the spiritual aspect of Israel, not the physical, natural one. For example, in Galatians 4, 26, the, the Jewish apostle Paul says, you and I and every believer have our birth due to the Jerusalem that is from above, not the one that's in Israel, the one that's from above. 
in the same letter, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, he refers to the church as what? To you, to me, every believer. He refers to the church, the Jewish apostle Paul does, as the Israel of God. So when we see Zion here, don't, don't limit it to people that are Jewish by birth. We're talking about believers. In Revelation 12, 1, we have this picture of the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and 12 stars. And we find out as we read through that chapter, she is the lady that brings forth the male child. I've, I've taught on this. You can get it in my series on Revelation. The male child is the end time company of believers specifically who will give their lives for the gospel. And then later on in the same area, we find a great multitude of believers no one can number, which is the great majority of believers that don't get martyred. Peter puts it like that very clearly in his letter. Even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, and thank God, he uses the fourth class condition in the Greek language, meaning very unlikely, First class condition assumed as true. Second class, contrary to fact. Third class condition, it might happen. Fourth class, it might, but unlikely. Aren't you glad? When I read that, I thought, thank you, Peter. Some are going to suffer that way, but unlikely, right, that, that, that many will. In any case, the other group of people, the Bible says, are made war against by the, the dragon. And who, who are the rest of her seed? Those who believe in God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So again, this spiritual mother, this spiritual Jerusalem, this Zion composed not only of, of Jewish folk that are saved, but of, of Gentiles also. And it, it also says this, um, the time of, of meeting, the time of favoring her, it has come. This is very encouraging. It's perfect tense, which means once this takes place, it will never have to be repeated. How many of you have read history and you see where God intervenes? He stopped this. He prevented the other. He restored the other. And that's beautiful. But it's again and again and again. This one that the psalmist was given insight into will not need to be repeated it will be the end. We'll no longer have to pray. Please come. Please favor Zion. Please favor the people of God. It will happen once for all forever. Why? Why this deliverance? Why is God going to favor Zion? Why is there going to be an assembling of God's people? Here it is. Read along with me. Psalm 102 verses 12 through 22. Because your servants... They remain pleased with her stones, and they will be favoring her dust. What kind of stones? What kind of dust? It's very simple to find that. Revelation 21, 19 speaks of the heavenly city garnished with precious stones on the gates, gates of pearl, and the sidewalk, clear gold. In other, in other words, these are people that are in love with God and with his plan for man and with his people, the Bible says the nations and kings of the earth will fear Yahweh's name and his glory when this divine day of deliverance comes. Anybody here looking forward to it? Or is it just the preacher? <laughs> I'm praying quite frequently. Show me the way out. Get me out of this. I had a dream, which I'll be sharing in, in some messages uh, soon. Uh, I had a dream that I was accosted in an elevator, first by one person when it was all over. There were about seven people in that elevator. The doors closed and no way out. And I know a little bit about martial arts. I taught it for a while and so on. But seven against one, the odds are not very good, especially in a small place. I wanted out. How about you? You would want out, I'm sure. So let's look now uh, at this divine day of deliverance. Here's where the psalmist declares how and when this will come about. Because Yahweh, he will build Zion. See that again? Not Jerusalem, not Israel. So he's talking about 
all of the redeemed, Jew and Gentile alike. He will build Zion. I love this. He will appear in glory. Two, two items stand out. First, this build Zion is again the idea that once it's done, it won't need to be redone. So this is not just a deliverance uh, like he gave Israel and then they were conquered again. No, this is once for all, forever. Secondly, the Lord who does the deliverance, who answers the prayer, who evens the scales finally, he will literally be seen. Something told me, have a look at the 70 on this verse. Have a look at what the Jewish translators chose when they came across this in the Hebrew Old Testament. In the New Testament, three words are usually used of Christ's appearing in glory. One is parousia, which means a coming and subsequent presence with. The idea is he comes, he doesn't come and go, he comes and stays. The second is epiphania, which we, we talk about an epiphany. Ah, I had an epiphany, I finally knew what car to buy. You know, what we mean, something, something suddenly comes and we know. Uh, epiphania means a, a, a manifestation, a shining forth. This is something nobody could miss. The other is similar. Apocalypsis means to uncover, uncover something. So it's like the clouds get pulled back and people see Jesus. Guess what? They didn't use any of those words here. They didn't use any of these words when it says that Yahweh will appear in glory. They use this verb, ophthesite, of Guess what that's from? Ophthalmos, which means sight. We get the English word op ophthalmologist. What is that? Who is he? An eye doctor. In other words, the Jewish translators, were they bent over backwards to make sure nobody could misunderstand that this is a literal, visible appearance of the invisible God. Wow. A literal event. Why should we even mention that, Pastor? Why? A number of reasons. One, here in America, one of our, one of our popular cults tells us that Jesus appeared in 1914. But it was a spiritual appearing. So nobody saw him. Doesn't that sound like they didn't heed the warning of Jesus himself? They will say, here he is, there he is, don't believe him. Because my coming will be like lightning from one end of the sky to the other. In other words, no one's going to possibly miss it. And that's the word they used here. I think this is fantastic. Look at this now. He will be turning toward the prayer of the destitute, like this psalmist who's being persecuted. The destitute one. And he will not despise their prayer. This will be kind of like the Lord responding, come quickly. When, Jesus, when, when John said, come quickly. And Jesus said, behold, I come what? Quickly. Now someone says, what you talking about, preacher? It's been 2,000 years. He said, I still hadn't gotten here. You call that quick? No, the word is tahi. Behold, I come tahi. It doesn't mean a short length of time. It means quickly, suddenly. Paul told the Roman believers, God will crush Satan, tahi, quickly under your feet. Doesn't mean it's going to happen by Friday. It means when it happens, <laughs> it's going to be instantaneously. Now, this is important, isn't it? When you think about God's divine day of deliverance. What if people, some people at least, are thinking, eh, Christianity, I don't know, just like some of the idiots that Peter talks about. You know, they've been saying he's coming for years. Everything just continues like it always has done. What if they have that attitude? Get saved? Uh, I think I'll wait a little bit. I'm just not sure I want to make that decision right now. I mm, might think about it. What did Jesus say? If they wait till they see him, they've waited too long. In the Matthew's gospel, uh, toward the end of the tribulation period, Jesus said, then they will see the sign of the Son of Man, right? And I, I don't know whether you've read books about it or not. There are all kinds of views about what the sign is. I remember one fellow thought it was a rainbow. Someone else, uh, some, I think one or two of the church fathers says it'll be a, a cross 
will appear, you know, before. No, no, no. It, that phrase, that, that statement that the Lord made is, in grammar, it's called a genitive of apposition, which means the two things are one. Then they will see the, son of, the sign of the Son of Man, meaning the Son of Man is the sign. Do you remember in John's gospel when uh, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days? And they said, how are you going to do that? It's been built, being built for 46 years, still not completely done. We're still touching it up. And John says what? But he spoke of the temple of his body. The temple and body are one and the same. When Jesus said they'll see the sign of the Son of Man, the Son of Man is the sign. He's just going to come, right? And if you wait till you see him, guess what? Oops. You waited too long. Here's the, uh, here's the continuation of our text Psalm 102, verse 12 through 22. Again, this is from the 70. I pulled this out, and I think you'll see why in a minute, because it, to me it's almost so graphic, so unusual, so really hard to believe that someone living 2,500 years ago now, and who knows when the Lord's going to return, could see this in advance. But when the, again, when the Jewish translators were working with the text and moving it into the language that would have been spoken by their brethren later, here's what they chose. Let this be written. The word this is afti. It is a demonstrative pronoun. So it's like the psalmist is saying he's pointing at it or circling it or underlining it or highlighting it. Let this be written. Now here it is. For another generation. Another generation. Can you picture this psalmist writing these words through tears? He's totally taken away now from being persecuted, from everything turning against him, from everything he touches turning to mud. He's looked up. He's in a new world altogether. Have you ever been there? It's the greatest thing that can ever happen to you, to tag out of your circumstances and let the Holy Ghost take your place. You just go ahead and go up, go up to that nice air-conditioned box and let the Holy Ghost be down on the field with, with all the rest of the team members and let him win that game for you. That's what happened to the psalmist. He got lifted up above, and this is what he said. Let this be written for another generation. Two ways he could have said that. Another, meaning just like every other generation that's come before me. In Greek, it would be alos, alon. Or he could do what he did. Another generation, it reads yeneyan, yeneyan, something that hasn't come to place. Something that hasn't come into being, something that hasn't been birthed. Yeneyan eteron. Another generation of a different kind. Eteron is from Eteros, not alos. Alos, the same kind. Eteros means different. We get the word heterosexual from that. You're heterosexual. You're attracted, uh, as God intended, for, to someone of the opposite sex. Think about this. This is written thousands of years in advance for a different people, a different generation than exists then or has existed. That's kind of mind-blowing. Well, was it going to be a new race? No more humans? What's going on? What are you talking about? Somebody spike your, uh, your wine? What's going on here? Watch this. It gets worse. And the people that shall be created shall praise Yah. Anybody here created? Not since Adam. We're born. Do you know what the word is here? <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this up. Ketizomes, ketizomenos, ketizomenos, from ketisis, which means to create out of nothing, brand new. Who in the world are these people that are different than every other earthly generation that's ever been or ever will be? Who are these people that aren't really going to be born, as we think of it, but created? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, there is what? A new thesis, same word. A new creation. 
old things passed away. Idu. Behold, wake up, smell the coffee. All things have become new. And the picture there is they became new and they'll never be old again. They'll never change again. He's prophesying that when the Lord returns and answers the prayers of people that are like him being persecuted, a whole lot of things are happening. One main one is there will be a whole new type of humanity. Hasn't been created yet. A, a, a generation different than every other one. Hallelujah. Once again, payday isn't always on Friday. When Yahweh, he looked down from the height of his holy place. Yahweh, he looked down from the heaven to the earth to hear the groans of prisoners. Anybody here groaning or is it just me? To hear the groans of prisoners to loose. The phrase is actually the sons of death. In other words, people that are scheduled to die. No way out, no one to help. To recount in Zion the name of Yahweh, look at this, and his praise where? In Jerusalem. So here, for the first time, he has both Zion, the spiritual picture of Israel, of the Jewish folk, of saved, redeemed people, including Gentiles, and Jerusalem. Both names appear. Jew, Gentile, one church, or as Paul puts it, one new man. And the last verse is startling. And look at it. Here's how it reads in the 70. When the people, when the people, this different generation, these people that have been created, are gathered together, the kings, to serve Yahweh. Gathered together is from the word synago, which is similar to synagogue, which is the word used by Paul and by Jesus of the gathering together of all of the elect when Jesus returns. The Jewish translators use this word, synadine, synadine, dine, which means to, to come together, just like we read numerous verses earlier. It's time for that meeting or assembly. That's when all of this is going to happen. And did you notice both the people are gathered together and the kings to serve Yahweh. How's that going to work? Revelation 5 verse 10. He has made us priests and kings unto our God. Can you fathom? You talk about making lemon aid out of lemons. This psalmist, unnamed, unknown, was given the privilege of the same prophetic insight that the Apostle Paul had thousands of years later. In advance, what a day it will be. And once this happens, it will never, ever need to be repeated. This is in, in actual fact God's divine day of deliverance. And you and I and every believer, Jew and Gentile alike, are going to be part of it. And the, the deck will no longer be stacked in the unbeliever's favor. He's going to right all the wrongs and make everything good. Any questions, input or output about this? Is this a little better than what you read in the newspaper or, read on, or hear on TV? Watch on TV. Yeah. So this is something to look forward to. Would you agree? And I really love that God does not mince words and we don't have to help him out. He's already told us he doesn't keep time like we do. And anybody that says, well, you know, one thing about it, nothing's happened yet. They're just fulfilling prophecy from Peter that that's what the idiots are going to say related to his second coming. And they'll miss it at country miles. Some of them waiting for a little bit of a sign before they make up their mind. Thank God the elect don't do that. We, we do it quick smart, right? Amen. We're going to come around the Lord's table. Solomon will lead us in that. If you have giving tonight, that's great. We have baskets here, one in the foyer. Uh, just got something in the mail, actually, a gift in the mail today because we had no offering Sunday. So.